Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 13th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular weekly segment on The Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain how Revenue Commissioner Adam Crum is misleading Alaskans. Second, the updates from North Slope Projects Willow and Pika are good, but the overall outlook from the slope needs to be tempered. And third, there is a lot of excitement about some new federal funding, but it requires an equally large state match, and no one is talking about who pays for that. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get into it here, Brad. Let's get started on number one, which is uh, the question of, is Adam Crum bad at math, or has uh, Mike Dunleavy just given up on the pfd what uh give me give me some give me some context here and let's run this down so there was an article last week in the frontiersman or uh, this week actually in the frontiersman uh reporting on a speech that adam crumb gave at the resource development council and the the title is alaska's finances look good revenue commissioner says still problems loom and the first paragraph sort of says says it all uh, Alaska's financials are looking good, State Revenue Commissioner Adam Crum says. The state budget is balanced, with oil, and with oil higher oil prices, there may even be a small surplus this year. Um, you will recall last week's show, the, the leadoff was, are the Democrats bad at math, or is there something else going on? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's going over to the Republican side now. What Crum is saying is, is the, the, the budget's in balance. Uh, we may even have a surplus. Uh, revenues are great. Well, the budget is in balance only if you ignore the PFD, only if you ignore that, that troublesome statute that still is on the books, that hasn't been amended, that, uh, that, that, that you know, specifies, sets, sets forth what the, how you calculate the PFD and what the PFD is supposed to be. The budget's in balance only if you ignore that statute. And, and what the Democrats are do, did that we talked about last week is the Democrats are saying, not only do you ignore that statute, you just sort of ignore that it ever existed. And you, and you just look at, the, at, at a budget on any given year and you only look at unrestricted general funds and you only look at those portion of un, unrestricted general funds that we want to look at. You don't look at the PFD portion. Uh, you only look at unrestricted general funds, and then you can say, then the Democrats say, not only is the budget in balance, it's in surplus, because as we discussed last week, Burt set aside $300 million, took $300 million extra out of the PFD to create this contingency fund that sits in the in the UGF budget. Crum doesn't go that far, but Crum says the, the, the FY24 budget is in balance. And and we're doing just fine and dandy. Thank you very much. Um, I just love that. you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. I mean, that's you know, that's insanity. The budget is balanced. We're spending more than we take in. Don't worry, it's still balanced. <laughs> and all all everybody is doing is is shifting the deficit that exists in the UGF budget. I mean, we're about a we're about a billion dollars in deficit, a billion three after you add on Bert's three hundred million dollar contingency. 
but we're about a billion dollars in deficit in the FY24 budget. And all they've done is they've taken and they've taken the that that billion dollars out of the PFD and moved it over to the UGF budget and says, ah, voila, it's balanced. And, you know, it's sort of like I did an analogy in the in the column I did last week for the landmine. It's sort of like the guy who, you know, has a credit card deficit that, you know, when he goes in for a for a you know new mortgage, the bank says, oh, you got this credit card in deficit. That's a problem. And he says, no, no worries about that. And takes, you know, whatever amount of money he needs out of his other credit card <laughs> and moves it into this credit card, you know, pays off this credit card and says, huh. Look, I'm balanced. You don't need to worry about that anymore. And ignores, you know, that he's just all he's done is move the deficit to the second credit card. And he's hoping he's hoping that the that the bank just overlooks that second credit card and doesn't doesn't say anything about it. Well, that's exactly what the Democrats last week that we talked about last week and what Adam Crum, Adam Crum, the Republican commissioner of of, of resources or, or revenue. What Adam Crum is is doing this 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 week, they're saying yes, the UGF budget uh, uh, is in deficit, but guess what? We'll just take money out of this other budget, out of the PFD. We'll move it over to the UGF, and we'll say and we'll say, you know, we're in balance. Don't look behind the curtain. Don't look at what we just did to the PFD, that statutory account that's created specifies i mean there's there's no confusion about how you calculate the pfd right the statute statute says what the statute says that 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 stat, that that account we just put in deficit just ignore that and um and and you know and we'll just declare you know we'll declare victory and 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 go on it is i mean either adam crumb's bad at math or a bad banker or 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 bad at everything uh and and doesn't account for what's going on that uh, on in that second account the pfd either he's bad at math or the republicans this is the republican commissioner of revenue the republicans are giving are just as bad as the democrats uh in giving up on the pfd and in and in trying to deal with the pfd without amending the statute they don't have the votes to amend the statute they've never had the votes to amend the statute <coughs> they've tried I mean, they, they say the statute doesn't matter, right? So the Democrats and, and Burt and others say the statute doesn't matter. But they tried to amend it last year. They tried to amend it to POMB 2575, and they couldn't get the votes to pass it. So they so they admit the statute means something. They admit it has some significance, or else they wouldn't try to amend it. Um, uh, but when when they can't amend it, they just ignore it and 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 hope it goes away. It, Michael, I the, the frustration level with with the democrats is high that frustration level is now transferring over to the republicans when you have people like the commissioner of revenue who says don't worry be happy we're all fine there is no deficit don't look behind the curtain don't look in that second account just take the fact that we transferred the credit card balance from one account to another just don't worry about that second account when the Republicans are saying that, the Republican administration, the commissioner of revenue that Dunleavy appointed and the legislature confirmed, when the Republican administration is saying that, you know, maybe it is time to, to you know, to, to think that think that somehow, you know, we're going to we're, we're never going to get out of this situation. Adam, well, Adam, Crum, Adam, one more thing. Adam Crumb did say there is a problem. But the problem, he said, is out migration. <laughs> it, yeah. Don't worry about don't don't worry about the budget. The, the real problem is people leaving. Well, why do you think people are leaving? Right. Because well, of and economics. I'm... And why are the economics bad? Because we're taking their money. We're taxing their money. We're taxing middle income Alaska families in excess of six percent. Um. Well, now migration is actually good for the state because it means the state, ex, you know, extend expends less money in the long run. So that's actually good for the state in that regard. Um, but I guess the whole thing boils down to <clears throat> Brad. Math is hard. I mean, that's really <laughs> what, math is hard, uh, and it is. It's shocking that we're seeing more and more uh, politicians and more and more uh, politicos on the Republican side coming with this not really we, we've seen it at the national level as well we're seeing that going on 
uh, as well. And it's just monkey see, monkey do. And more and more states are trying to live beyond their means and and, uh, you know, basically green light or gaslight all the gaslight, all the their, their constituencies to say, all is fine. Nothing to see here. Move. It's like the city's on fire. He's at a podium giving a press conference and the city's on fire behind him. And he's like, look, it's all fine. Move along. That's what's going on. Um, and what's, I guess, really disappointing is to see how thoroughly the Dunleavy has given up on his one of his main campaign pillars, which was, you know, the PFD. Um, and he was pretty quiet about it this last go around this last election cycle, but he still was saying he wanted to get a full PFD. And yet we have seen all talk, no action. And uh, this is part of the problem. We've got about a minute and a half here. Well, what's 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 even more concerning or, or as concerning as anything else in here is that Crum isn't even mentioning it. There, there's no mention in the entire article. There was no mention in his speech when I went back and listened to it. There isn't any mention of of the problem with the PFD and how they're how they're going to address it. I mean, Dunleavy at least last spring went out and gave the famous press conference where he says we're going to have a sales tax in the next few days or a sales tax bill in the next few days. Never did, but at least you know at least he acknowledged there was an issue. Crum, Commissioner of Revenue again. Crum doesn't even mention it. I mean, when he talks about problems that need to be addressed, it's not spending. There, there's not an issue about spending. There's not an issue about, about you know, the, the, the anything else other than, you know, out migration. There's not a mention of the PFD. And that's, it, it's sort of like ignore it and it will go away. It's, it's the Democrats, it's the Democrats playbook that now Adam Crum, at least, uh, Commissioner of Revenue, uh, is adopting uh, for the, for the Dunleavy administration. It's frustrating. Um, and of course, I guess that just means that it's politics as usual. I guess at some point, Brad, do we just do we, do we just throw in the towel and try and triage this thing? Or I mean, it's it's I just don't know when your allies are the ones that are throwing you under the bus. I don't know your supposed allies. I, I don't know what the answer to this is at this point. Yeah, let's not count Adam Crum as a as an ally. I don't think Adam yeah, Crum is. No. Well, I'm and, not even sure that Dunleavy is an ally at this point. I mean, Michael, we could, but you know, we address we we had this question come up at the end of last week's show about, you know, it's just time to is is it time to move on from the PFD? And the problem is, if we do that, you're giving free reign to the remaining eight hundred million dollars or so. That's in the PFD. If we just say, forget about the PFD, we're not going to, this is not a hill we're going to die on anymore. Uh, uh, you know, we'll just, we'll, we'll ignore the statute along with everybody else. It's just another $800 million of spending. And you, and you build up more constituencies and you build up more, more inertia, more activity so that when we hit the next downturn, whether it happens in the, in the permanent fund earnings reserve, the, the earnings off the permanent fund, or it happens in oil prices, when we hit the next downturn, you will have a higher level of spending uh, that's going on that uh, that then is going to need, you're going to have constituencies build up around that higher level of spending. And then you're going to have people saying, well, we need more and more and more taxes to support that level of spending uh, uh, because we've used up the PFD and building up to that level of spending and we don't have, we don't have other revenues. We don't have another safeguard um, out there. So th this is... To me, this is the point at which you've got to make the stand. If you don't want, you know, if you don't want that additional buildup of additional spending, you don't want that additional plateau that we're going to hit at some point and people are going to scream for more spending. This is the hill you got to stand on and, and, and you've got to fight on. And the other thing, the thing I said last week and the thing I truly believe, you've got to get all Alaskans engaged in the fight. The problem with using the PFD is that is that it only affects middle and in, lower income Alaska families? The top twenty percent say we don't care because we're not giving up anything by using the PFD. Spend all you want, uh, just don't tax us and and uh, and and you know continue on using the PFD. So if you don't stand on this hill and say, look, if we're going to spend, all Alaskans plus non residents plus the oil companies have to share in the burden of that additional spending. If you don't stand on that hill. Uh, there's, there's, you don't have any, you don't have, you know, all Alaskans pushing back on spending. You have some Alaskans pushing for spending and you have other Alaskans, critical Alaskans, the donor class sitting there going, we don't care ambivalent about it. So it's this, this is a hill that's, that, that, 
you know, at least for me, is is the important hill to stand on, the important hill to fight on. And every time that you see somebody like Adam Crum, uh, Commissioner of Revenue, uh, <laughs> uh, taking the same stand as the Democrats on this issue, saying, "Yeah, don't worry about the PFD. Don't even, you know, don't even mention the PFD." Every time you have a Republican doing that, I think it's important to call them out and to and to identify what's going on, which is they're just giving space for more and more and more and more and more and more spending um, uh, and creating more and more and more impetus, more and more constituencies behind spending uh, and creating larger problems for the state in the years ahead. That's the problem is that, again, we, we keep using the analogy of the bridge is out and you're in the engine car and instead of putting your hand on the brake and, and gently applying it or, or slamming it on, you're just like, here, hold my beer and you keep shoveling coal right into the box. That's exactly what's going on. I mean, we're, we're we could see what the outcome of this is in future years if you're if you're honest about it. Uh, I mean, the the OMB has shown it. I mean, all these other things have shown it. And yet they still act like, well, if we just keep pretending like it'll be OK, it'll be OK. Um, and that's I think that's where we're at. We're playing make believe at this point. Um, same thing we're doing at the national level, like it's all going to be OK. Um, but, uh, you know, it's it's again, it's monkey see monkey do at that point. Welcome back to the program. Weekly top three continues with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, we're talking about Willow and Pika, Judge Gleason, the federal judge who is overseeing the case from multiple uh, environmental groups from around the state and outside, trying to shut down the Willow Project, has decided that the Biden administration did the right thing and that Willow's approval was good. It's going to be appealed, I'm sure, but uh, it is a go-ahead for Willow to get started on their winter work. Willow, Willow and Pika could have some big impacts on Alaska, but maybe not as much as we think, Brad. Give us the details here. So Judge Gleason did decide, she said she would decide in November. She did decide in November uh, on the appeals of the Willow, of the uh, of the EIS, the Enver Environmental Impact Statement that the Department of Interior had issued uh, approving Willow going forward. Uh, she decided on those appeals and decided that, uh, that the government had done its job, uh, had thoroughly examined the, the, the issues re that need to be examined in an environmental impact statement. And and de decline to reverse or to or to put a hold on uh, the Department of uh, Interior's approval for Willow to go ahead. Uh, it will be appealed to the Ninth Circuit. Um, the, the I think the appeals have already been filed, uh, but Conoco feels confident enough with Judge Gleason's decision, with the with the with the BLM having done the job they did, they did the Bureau of Lands Management having done the job they did, and with and with uh, uh, Judge Gleason having uh, approved it, uh, confident or Conoco feels confident enough to go ahead uh, and start uh, start the process that they had been putting off, uh, which is to start the development of the uh, of the Willow Project out west. That's good news, um, and and Tim Bradner has a good article in the front again in the Frontiersman. Not a, a pretty good source of uh, information. Um, headline is busy season on North Slope, seen with decision on Willow. And Tim talks about uh, the Willow decision, talks about continued development uh, on uh, on Pika, uh, which is in the central North Slope. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the North Slope map here with my hands. So if, the, if that's that's what anybody wonders. Yeah, talking um, with your hands on radio is always good. <laughs> <laughs> so you have the Willow decision. Uh, you have Willow proceeding ahead on the western North Slope. You have Pika in, sort of in the central North Slope um, uh, going forward uh, with the development there. And then he also talks about another um, uh, Armstrong uh, uh, effort. Now, Armstrong is the, is the Armstrong Oil and Gas is the one who initially developed the Pika project. Uh, and then sold it once, uh, sort of, sort of monetized it once, uh, once he proved the the concept. Bill Armstrong uh, sold it to uh, Santos, what's now Santos and uh, and Repsol. And you have a discussion in in that uh, uh, Bradner article about an activity that uh, uh, Armstrong is can, is engaged in on the eastern North Slope, which has not been historically not over the last few decades not been a hotbed of activity. Uh, but on the eastern North Slope, 
um, uh, in in exploring uh, uh, prospects around the eastern North Slope, and says that uh, Apache Oil Company has has engaged in those as well, and that that's another good sign. And Alaska benefits from all those activities, not only in the sense of additional oil, but Alaska oil and gas jobs really come from construction. They really come from the development of new fields and the activity around the development of new fields. So you have you have that going on now in Willow, you have that going on in Pika, and you have the beginnings of a project. Uh, maybe uh, over in the eastern North Slope. North Slope. All of that's good. All of that's good for uh, the oil companies. All of that's good for future production. All of that's good for the contractors. There are two. There are two things that that need to temper. Uh, you know, throwing, you know, have, throw, popping the champagne and having the party. Though, one is because of the way the oil taxes are structured. Uh, one is Willow's actually going to result in less revenues for the state for a period of time. The reason for that is that, that we have a net profits tax, uh, our production tax is a net profits tax, and construction costs are a deduction, essentially a deduction from, uh, from profits uh, in calculating net profits and calculating the, the amount subject to tax. And, and Willow is not going to add any, any, for a period of time, Willow won't add any production, won't add any revenues um, uh, for, from production to the state, but it will increase costs because there will be a lot of construction activity and a lot of construction expense. So actually, in the near term, Willow and Pika uh, uh, will be the same, and, and potentially Armstrong's activities uh, on the eastern North Slope. Um, I'm not quite sure where else Armstrong is, but potentially the activities on the eastern North, North Slope will result in a reduction in revenues as those as those construction expenses expenses uh, come through and act as a as a deduction in tax. That's one thing to sort of temper all the temper the temper the champagne popping. The second is something that we've been noticing. Um, as we do what we call the Thursday chart, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Thursday chart, which looks at current production from the North Slope compared to uh, where it should be, compared to what the state's forecast was. And this year has been running considerably below uh, uh, what the projections that the state included uh, in the spring revenue forecast. Right now, as of the last Thursday chart, um, we are uh, 9%, 10% uh, below the forecast amount um, uh, for the for the state. And that that assumes that 9% assumes that somehow we, you know, we pop back up to, to where we should be for the remainder of the year. Uh, it, it, the trend is to run below throughout the uh, throughout the year significantly. 10% is a significant number in terms of oil production forecast. So 10% below significantly below uh, the, the, the projection that the Dunleavy administration made uh, back in the spring. That means if that's, if that's true and that reflects, if that continues and that reflects what's going on in sort of the base North Slope, North Slope if you will, that means that we're having a reduction in, in production from, from the base North Slope faster, a decline faster uh, than we anticipated it was going to occur. So while Willow and Pika uh, will help offset that, will help, you know, uh, will we'll bring additional rep, will bring, bring additional volumes on and help to offset that decline, it's going to be, it's going to be starting from a lower base than, than I think some anticipated when they put together the last, uh, the last production forecast. And so there'll be an increase as a result of bringing those those fields on stream, but the increase in overall production won't be as much because the base is declining, and that's that's worrisome. If we're having a if we're having decline rates faster than we anticipated, with respect to the base volumes, that's um, that's concerning because the the future, the future you know somewhat rosy projections about oil forecasts have been have been calculated assuming. You know, Willow comes on at, at gangbuster volumes. Pika comes on at gangbuster volumes, and the base holds up. If the base is sort of declining faster than we anticipate, that sort of third leg of the stool that that leads to leads to a much better uh, future in terms of oil oil production um, won't <laughs> it won't be as good. It won't be as good. So, 
great news about Willow. Great news uh, that uh, that has been approved. Great news that's going forward. But don't expect a revenue pop. In fact, expect a revenue decline uh, for a significant period of time. Another piece of the oil taxes are that there isn't any tax on new production for a period of time. So not only do we have a revenue decline for a period of time as the construction costs come through and act as discussion as as, as deductions from 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 revenues from profits, uh, there's also a period of time after that that there won't be taxes produced. Construction period will be over. We won't have the we won't have the deductions but we won't have a revenue pop because there's a period of time that revenues won't be produced uh, from new volume. So the revenue benefit of Willow is several years out, maybe 10 years out. Uh, the revenue benefit from Pika is several years out. Um, and, and it's great to have these additional volumes, but don't expect a revenue pop um, as a result of these additional volumes going, coming on. It's one, it's one of these things about the oil industry that's sort of, sort of interesting um the private sector benefits because we have all this construction and all these jobs and all this activity the state doesn't benefit at all in fact the state the state sort of subsidizes it through having through allowing all those costs to be deductions from uh, from from taxes so it's um we, we're going to see a lot of news about oh the oil industry is doing better there's all these jobs all these people are working all this activity but we're going to see a state revenue decline uh, as uh, as that goes on, well, and of course, as the time goes on, and as you said, these projects are you know seven years, ten years from really starting to put money back in the bank. We of course have a continual decline in the meanwhile. So by the time it hits, and even if it is one hundred and eighty thousand barrels a day that they're talking about overall from these fields, how much is the decline going to hit between now and then? Are we going to be back to where we just are right now, or maybe a little more? Uh, and that's a and that's a challenge, especially again, as you look at the especially when they continue to make mistakes in the uh, revenue projections on this kind of stuff, which is historically they're never accurate. They're never they're I mean, it's a you know, it's pie in the sky at that point. Well, they're never going to be accurate because you can't you can't predict with absolute precision where the, where sure. the production is going to be. But, you know, this 10 percent is 45, 45 uh, thousand barrels a day. Um, 45,000 barrels a day on a, on a production base of, you know, 450,000 barrels a day is quite a bit. Um, and it's, um, uh, in, and, and it's fully, it's fully tax paying 45,000 barrels a day, uh, as compared to, you know, compared to 45,000 days from, from Willow, which is, which won't be tax paying for a period of time. So you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it, it is not only do we have the hit coming from the Willow construction costs and the Pika construction costs, taking tax or acting as deductions and taking tax revenues down. Not only do we have a period of time that there won't be tax because we don't tax uh, new production, but during that, during that period, as the base declines faster, as it appears that the base is declining faster than we anticipated, we will be losing revenues from from that as well. So, projections, the revenue project. Going back to Adam Crumb's point, revenue projections aren't great. I mean, they're 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 not they're not terrific, not not robust, if you will. The the dollars Over, involved overly are not rosy. At this point. Overly rosy is what you're saying. They're not. It doesn't look great. Uh, it's just like you know, at, at about the time the taxes hit, says Bill, that's when production numbers drop significantly. I mean, that's. Again, if we're just offsetting and swapping one for the other, what what do we need to, you know, it's <clears throat> it's painful. It's painful to see. Brian said he kind of he kind of uh is paraphrasing what you and I have been talking about for a long time. Brian says it's not a question of if we get an income tax, but when. The ledger critters have shown blessed little courage to do the fiscally responsible sane or adult things as they draw their salaries. And um I mean, I think that's it. I think a lot of this is somehow we know better than you. It's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Fine, fine, just fine. I mean, that's, it's, wow. Well, Michael, I want to make the point that we already have an income. We already have a tax. We already have an income tax. It's an income tax that's targeted on permanent fund uh, dividends. It, what, what we're really, what we're going to be facing is not only that tax, but an expanded tax that's going to attach to other income uh, as well. We're already there. 
um, and I guess my my point in the last in the last uh, segment or the last break was this is the hill to stand on. This is the hill to die on because we're already there. We're, we're already being taxed now. The tax is focused on middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, it's a heavy tax on middle and lower income Alaska families, as I said. The the FY twenty four budget essentially is a six percent overall six percent overall income tax on middle income. Alaska families, the middle 60%, lower, the average for the lower middle, 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 and, and upper middle, if you look at this in quintiles. Um, uh, the average tax on middle income Alaska families is 6%. We're already there. What we're looking at is taxes, is taxes beyond that, continuing taxes continuing to build beyond that. So if we don't fight the battle now, if we let them have the $800 million, let the government have the $800 million that's remain 800 plus million dollars that's remaining in the PFD um, without, without a battle. If we just say, Oh, forget that, you know, you can have it. We'll, we'll agree that the statute doesn't mean anything, notwithstanding the fact you can't get the votes to change it. We'll agree. The statute doesn't mean anything. You can have that $800 million. Then that, that just increases the tax, uh, the existing tax exponentially and sets up the next layer of tax that, that, that comes on, comes on top of it. So the time to be fighting the battle is now. Um, and, and the, and, and what you want in this battle is to expand the forces that are pushing back. You want to lower the burden, uh, as it exists on middle and lower income Alaska families and expand the, expand the, the burden across, across more people so that more people are pushing back, um, on, on spending levels. That's, that's, that's the, it's the entire point about, uh, uh, that we've been trying to make over the, over the period of time about going to a flat tax. It's not. It's not that. It's not that we're adding on a tax. We're substituting a broader-based, more inclusive tax for the for the tax that's hitting now. And of course, the argument has just popped up that a PFD cut is not a true tax. I mean, I you know we can argue about it. it has the effect of a tax, whether you call it a tax or a, a a service fee or I mean whatever you call it. It has the effect of it. It takes away that percentile of income from people who would otherwise receive it. Um, and that, of course, you know, again, assuming that it is their money, which I think most of us agree with. I know Randy doesn't, but most of us agree with. Well, look, I mean, Matt Berman, uh, uh, ICER professor, uh, Harvard trained, Yale trained, uh, uh, ICER professor, been in the state since 81, since, since the time the PFD was adopted, the longest serving uh, ICER, uh, ICER analyst there is, Matt DeBerman in last year's in an op-ed in, in a op-ed, or I guess it was earlier this year uh, in the AD, ADN said, let's be honest, the PFD, PFD cuts are a tax, the most regressive tax ever, ever proposed. I mean, we can argue this. I mean, you, know, you, you can have people, you know, write comments that, but look, we got a Harvard, Yale trained P, uh, uh, PhD economist who's saying it's a tax. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue with Bert. Yeah. No. So I mean, no matter what you call it, the effect is the same. I mean, that's I guess my whole point, my whole point was the the effect is the same. Whether you call it a tax or not, the effect is it takes that percentile of income out of people's hands and it's disproportionately affecting the lower, you know, the lower 80 percentile um uh, comparatively and allowing this runaway spending to continue. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, legislators with the, with the pay raise, all the legislators, all every last one of the legislators have been, now moved into the top 20%, all of them. And, and so, you know, even the youngest, even the most inexperienced moved into the top 20% as a result of the legislative pay raise, uh, adding in the per diem. So, you know, <laughs> I, we got taxation without representation. I mean, we got all of them in the top 20% voting to tax the remaining 80%. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a sad situation that we've fallen into. So I, as you say, the economic effect is the same. Yeah. Uh, confiscatory, uh, confiscatory, confiscatory, uh, call it confiscatory. If it helps says, uh, Donna confiscating private property. I mean, yeah, whatever you want to call it, the effect essentially in the end is exactly the same potato, potato. It still makes great hash browns continuing now the final segment of the weekly top three number three of the weekly top three the feds want to give out some money oh but there's always a hook somewhere in there 
That looks like bait. Look at that juicy chunk of chum out there. Let's just snap on that. Oh, wait, there's a hook in it. Uh, that's the problem. And that's what a lot of people don't look at. Uh, I've seen it when I worked in the borough government. Same kind of thing. Oh, it's free money. Well, no, it's first of all, it's not free. Somebody paid for it. Second of all, what do we have to pay to get it? Brad, um, what's uh, what's the details here? All right. So James Brooks has an article um, uh, that's been it's in the Alaska Beacon, but it's been running most of the major papers. Headline is, at least the ADN headline is, huge new federal, huge, huge new federal grant promises easier access for cheaper, cleaner power in the Alaska rail belt. And what's this, what, what it's talking about is a federal grant that uh, the Alaska Energy Authority, which is a, a subsidiary of ADA, uh, uh, has, has been able to get from the federal government to help bolster up uh, the state's uh, transmission line. Alaska uh, is, as I said, sort of strung together with one transmission line that runs from Homer uh, all the way up to Fairbanks. It has various roots and branches, but but that's sort of the basic concept. It has limit. It's old enough, and it's and it's limited enough that it has a, a limited capacity to, for example, to add new sources of supply, as as these new solar fields or the new wind farms come uh, come into existence. It's it's not altogether easy to add them to the existing system because of limitations that that exist uh, in the in the transmission line. So the the, the uh, upgrading the transmission line, essentially replacing the transmission line uh, over time, has been a has been a goal of the electric utilities uh, for as long as as I've followed the electric electric utilities back into the 1990s. It's something that they've that, the, that they've identified they need to do. So up pops this federal grant as part of the it's part of the Biden uh, uh, Infrastructure Act. Up pops the availability of this federal grant uh, to uh, to help or to help fund replacement of the transmission line, um, and and the federal grants for two hundred and six million dollars. I think it is a uh, significant chunk uh, toward the cost of the transmission line. But here's the kicker: <laughs> the federal grant. Is only is contingent on is only for half of the cost of the upgrade and is contingent on the state matching that grant dollar for dollar. So to get the two hundred and six million dollars of federal money to go toward the transmission line, uh, the state has to come up with a with a matching amount. It can't it can't say oh we'll give we'll give a little bit. It has to come up with with an equal amount uh, to meet the criteria of the grant. Um, and so, and so we're faced with, okay, we got this $206 million. We got half the cost of the upgrade of the transmission line that everybody's been, been, uh, been pleading for, been building toward, been talking about all these years. We got half the cost. The state has to come up with the other, the other half the cost and, and the electric people say, but it's only half the other costs. I mean, we're getting two, we're getting half of it out of the federal government. So we only have to come up with the, with the other half instead of all of it as we've talked about before, but the state has to come up with that extra amount. Here's the issue that, that I'm going to focus on, that I want to focus on here, and, I, and I'm going to continue to focus on as we discuss about it, discuss it. Who pays for that $200 million on, on the state side? The beneficiaries are going to be um, uh, the people in the rail belt who get added added benefits, added security as a result of upgrades to the transmission line. The beneficiaries are going to include the wind the wind farm uh, producers who are going to get access to the grid that they've had difficulty getting access to over time. The beneficiaries are going to be um, the, the people in the rail belt who get lower, who have lower energy costs, lower electricity costs than they otherwise might uh, have. Uh, if uh, if these upgrades weren't done and the limitations of the existing electric transmission system continued to uh, continue to exist, we can identify who the beneficiaries are. But what's going on is is of course, and and the beneficiaries you can you 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 can not only identify them, there are ways to assess the cost to them. You can increase the cost of of electric energy to. Uh, to people in the rail belt for those additional costs, you can in, you can you can charge access fees to the wind farms for access uh, to the grid uh, that reflect uh, the recovery of those additional costs that that they're going to benefit from. You can you you there are mechanisms 
to charge those costs to those who benefit. But the press now is on the state funding uh, that additional $200 million. How, and the questions in this article and elsewhere are, how's the state going to come up with this $200 million that it needs to come up with to match the, to match the federal grant in order to, uh, to fund these, uh, to fund, fund these improvements. Um, and, and, you know, the answer is, well, we'll just add it to the capital budget. All right. So where's the money going to come from to fund that increment in the capital budget? And the way we're set up right now, we all know the answer to that. Although, you know, Adam Crumb might not, but we all know the answer to that, which is additional PFD cuts. So right now we're set up to fund this additional $200 million on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families throughout the state to fund these improvements that are going to benefit people in the rail belt and, and wind farm and other producers who are going to get access to the grid uh, uh, in, in the rail belt. We, we, this state is not very good at matching costs to those who create the costs uh, or who benefit uh, from, from the costs. Um, and, and so we're, we're, we're going down this road. This is how we get into this, in these budget situations. We're going down this road again, where the answer is, oh, we'll just have the state fund it, uh, fund this additional two hundred million dollars, and we'll just uh, we'll just uh, include it as part of the UGF spending, and we'll just uh, you know we'll just fund it out of uh, out of additional PFD cuts. Can't afford to pay, pay the PFD, notwithstanding the statutes there um, uh, that tells us how to do it. Can't afford to fund the PFD because you know we got all these we've got all these additional costs. It it I hate these headlines that say big. Big project for the state, big bonus for the state, big plus for the state. And don't have a subheadline that say, "Oh, by the way, and you got to pay for it," and 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 we're in, and we need to address who pays for it uh, uh, as part of the process. This article sort of does that in a way by saying uh, the state has to come up to match it dollar for dollar, but James doesn't dive down into who uh, would bear the burden of that right. of that dollar for dollar matching. Right, because the headline reads, huge new federal grant promises easier access for cheaper, cleaner power in Alaska's rail belt. And it should have a sub subheadline that says, oh, by the way, the state has to pay, you know, you all the other citizens of the state have to pay for it as well, even though they won't benefit. So the people in Kodiak or Alaska or any place else that's listening to this uh, that's not on the rail belt power system, the, you know, they're on the hook for it just as well. Yeah, exactly right. And it's not, it's not just that they're on the hook for it. The, the, the way we're funding these things now through PFD cuts, it's, it's that the, that middle and lower income Alaska families, it's not, you know, sometimes people argue, oh, PFD cuts are justified because after all, you know, it's the, it's lower families that get all the benefits of, get all these benefits out of the, out of, out of government anyway. It's not true. Uh, there's no study that shows that. Uh, and you can, you, when people cherry pick and, you know, pick certain things that, that say, oh, this is this is how government, you know, disproportionately funds lower income families. You can you can you can tear those things apart. Uh, but you know, th there's no argument, no argument here that you possibly can make that that this two hundred million dollars to match the federal grant uh, for the transmission line is something that is peculiar a peculiar benefit that ought to be charged right. to middle and lower income Alaska families statewide. Right. Well, I can see the argument, though, already, though. Well, that's what the power cost equalization fund is for. All right. I mean, isn't that what we're told that to offset all the expenditures and the investments that we've made in the rail belt and all those, I mean, all the dollars that they've gotten, that's why we put the power cost equalization fund in there so that they get there. So the rural and other communities get their fair share as well. I mean, I, I could see that argument already. Yeah, well. The, the power cost equalization does something with respect to elsewhere in the state, but it's sort of it's sort of built up over time. And I'm not sure it's going to adjust a lot for the benefits of this additional 200 million. And in particular, uh, power cost equalization uh, isn't isn't focused on middle and lower income families. It's focused on everybody in a region. So I'm not, right. I'm not quite sure that one that one that one holds water. I mean, since when is the. Since when has the federal government uh, ever done, you know, anything efficiently? Uh, I mean, even Harold acknowledges that the feds granted 40 million to bring broadband to 500 folks in New Ixit, But hey, Starlink is only 90 bucks a month. Why are we bullying out all this broadband and hardwired stuff 
for $40 million for 500 people when we could just send every one of them a Starlink and call it good. You know, I mean, that it, uh, he's not wrong. This is, again, just another example of, uh, you know, how the government's here to help us in the most inefficient way possible, uh, which seems to be a, a common thread um, around it. And that $40 million is a drop in the bucket compared to all the broadband projects around the state. Why are they? Why, I mean, which, again, goes back to the corporate cronyism we've talked about in the past. Right, Brad? Because companies like GCI are all like, oh, yeah, absolutely. We'll take that billion dollars and spend. We'll don't worry about it. We've got it covered, you know. Uh, right. Instead of looking for a better solution, like for example, Starlink. Among some of my friends, we refer to the G- the the broadband bill as the GCI bailout bill. I mean, the the, the way to get to, the way to get GCI more money. Got to you got to follow the dollars on this stuff to figure out figure out who's benefiting. It's like Medicaid. I mean, the the, the discussions we've had over time about Medicaid. People say, "Oh, well, it's, you know, it's really." It's really, you know, lower income families that benefit from Medicaid. That's one of the arguments about how lower income families really, you know, disproportionately benefit from government spending. And so, and so it's, it's justified that the PFD cuts uh, uh, target them. Well, Medicaid, if you follow the dollars, the Medicaid dollars actually end up in the bank accounts of the, of the health care providers. Uh, the docs in uh, a surprising number of whom are out of state uh, docs uh, who come in and, and do their practice here and then leave. Um uh, it, it, the Medicaid, the Medicaid dollars end up on behalf of the docs at the federal level. We talk a lot about, you know, about the farm bill and the farm bill or snap. We talk a lot about snap, uh, snap is the, part of the farm bill. Right. Yeah. Right. Supplemental nutritional assistance, food stamps, whatever, whatever they are, food stamps. Uh, we talk a lot about, you know, food stamps and how food stamps disproportionately benefit the poor. Well, the, <laughs> the biggest proponents of snap, the biggest proponents of food stamps, Stamps is the agricultural lobby, because because those purchases help support uh, farm prices and and you know when Republicans start talking about you know reductions in SNAP reductions in in dollars going to food stamps it's the it's the it's the farm state Republicans who who get up in arms and who who block that sort of that sort of uh, that sort of of action you got to follow the dollars on this stuff and 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 to some extent you got to try to match cost responsibility with cost causation. If you don't do that, um, then, you know, it, like we have in Alaska, if you don't charge those who cause the costs with with the costs, if they don't pay the cost, then they're all in favor of adding more and more and more and more spending because they don't have to pay for it. And the people who get burdened with paying for it uh, don't necessarily benefit from it or don't necessarily benefit, aren't, aren't the only beneficiaries of it. But they get more and more and more of the burden. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how see how this two hundred million dollars for uh, for the the state's share of the of the transmission line uh, plays out. I uh, to me, a large part of it needs to be charged in the rail belt to the electric uh, users uh, and to the electric providers, the wind farms and others who are going to benefit from this upgrade to the transmission line. Those are the cost causers. Or the cost beneficiaries, um, and they ought to be the ones that that bear a, board, uh, a share of it. They're going to profit from having this upgraded transmission line uh, available. They need to share in the costs of that. But doing it doing it the way that people are now talking about doing it, just through the capital budget, and just you know, it'll pop out of additional pop out from additional PFD cuts. That doesn't match cost causation to cost responsibility in any way shape or form and it's gonna it's gonna lead to it just leads to like everything else more and more spending creating more and more constituencies in favor of spending uh who don't have to pay for it and so yeah i'm in favor of it because i don't have to pay for it shit yeah go go ahead um no we we don't we don't we just don't we don't do things right in this state in terms of in terms of fiscal policy well it's because we're living in a delusional it's a delusional reality, right? I mean, and I, I keep going back to it. I know I don't cover a lot of national stuff on the show, but um, even I have been watching what's going on with the new Speaker of the House and, you know, the the whole shutdown that we averted, right? Oh, we averted it. Yeah, we moved it to a week from today. I mean, that's essentially what happened. We moved it one month and now we're in crisis mode again and they're all running around like we don't know what's going on and nobody is willing to address the problem. That by twenty by twenty thirty five, 
you know, Social Security and Medicaid, uh, Medicare, they're out of money. You know, by 2050, we're at 240 percent of GDP and we're beyond we can't reverse the flow at that point. It's the we've gone beyond where we can reverse it. Um, it's going to create not just a, a default of what we have today, but a real default where they don't just delay the payments. They just don't make the payments. And that will I mean, it's a catastrophic effect. And and everybody's screaming about it. Every even the uh, even the. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the office of, uh, a budget and audit or, you know, I mean, all the, they're even, they're even saying, whoa, 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 our projections are, and they are mandated by law to take some unrealistic assumptions in their, uh, in their factors. And even they are saying it's not, but no, but everybody's like, oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. I, we're literally living in delusional times, less than a minute. Well, and we've created all these constituencies, right? The farm bill is a perfect example. One of the places the Republicans off the top of their head say we're going to cut is SNAP. But then the but then the farm state Republicans say, oh no, you can't do that, you can't cut SNAP, and and you can't cut the farm, you can't cut you know supplemental nutritional assistance because that's going to affect uh, agriculture prices. So ev everybody's got their own constituency they're looking out for. Nobody's looking out for the overall. Nobody's trying to right look, the long term. Nobody's thinking long term. It's always the next election. Uh, last thirty seconds, Brad. I'll let you take it here. Michael, we got a problem in the state, and 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 the problem's expanding. I mean, the problem is last week we talked about the problem with the Democrats. This week it's Adam Crum uh, and the Republicans. They don't recognize fiscal reality. They they want to they want to create this new la la land where everything's okay. It's not, and we need to keep identifying. We need to keep pushing back and saying it's not. And we need to. This is these are ways we need to to do to to get it better. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming in on this Tuesday for the Weekly Top 3. We appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much. Always, Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.